Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, so we'll just pull up Danny Heng's slides there. Fantastic. All right, so I'm tasked with talking about prognostic factors in metastatic renal cell carcinoma and why are they relevant in practice. Um, so thank you for all being here. So as you know, there are many different prognostic factors available, and they can help risk stratify our patients X, Y, and Z. And they're patient factors. The most important one out of all of any prognostic factor system, of course, is performance status and whether or not they have symptoms. There's some tumor burden factors, such as prior nephrectomy, uh, sites of metastases, bone metastases, bone metastases, sometimes are refractory to uh, some of the treatments that we have, uh, liver metastases, LDH, uh, anemia, calcium, sodium. There are pro-inflammatory markers. You've heard of IL-6 today. Uh, the ESR, neutrophilia is a marker of inflammation. Thrombocytosis is as well. And of course, C-reactive protein, which are really prominent in Asian uh, prognostic factors. There are also treatment-related factors. What did you have for your prior therapy? Did you need radiation beforehand? Uh, what's your disease-free interval? Because if you had a long disease-free interval, it's just more indolent disease. Uh, what's your diagnosis to treatment interval? So similar uh, uh, to the disease-free interval. And of course, uh, as you voted in the room, uh, this is a very uh, commonly used prognostic pr uh, pro system profile. This is the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center prognostic profile, and it uses calcium, LDH, uh, hemoglobin, uh, time to diagnosis to treatment, and Karnofsky performance status as the five prognostic factors. And you can see there's a favorable risk group, intermediate risk group, and poor risk group. And this was developed in the era of tar uh, in the era of immunotherapy. So these median overall sur of survivals here reflect uh, the immunotherapy era. Uh, sponsored by the KCA, actually here, uh, the International Kidney Cancer Working Group also developed a, a set of prognostic criteria. They're more complex. Uh, they uh, use a lot more uh, different prognostic criteria, so it's a little bit harder to use. Uh, but again, you can see that there's a favorable, intermediate, and poor risk population. In the dotted lines here, this was um, in, the, in the targeted therapy age. So the solid lines are the immunotherapy age, and the dotted lines are the targeted therapy age. And you can see that across all subgroups, there's a difference uh, in uh, overall survival. Uh, we are lucky to have the uh, International MRCC Database Consortium. Currently, it includes 3,700 patients from 25 institutions. Back when it was six institutions big, uh, we developed the International MRCC Database Consortium, the IMDC criteria, as I prefer to call them, uh, the prognostic factors. And as you know, there are two clinical factors, the Karnofsky performance status of less than 80%, a diagnosis to treatment interval of less than one year, and four laboratory factors, anemia, hypercalcemia, neutrophilia, and thrombocytosis. All of those are each individually, independently associated with the poor overall survival. If a patient has zero of those risk factors, they're in the favorable risk group. If, they're, uh, if they have one or two of those factors, they're in the intermediate risk group. If they have three to six of those factors, they're in the poor risk group. And this is how they stratify out. So uh, we externally validated it in a group of another thousand patients that we haven't studied before, and this is the external validation of all patients treated in the targeted therapy era, so not in the immunotherapy era. And you can see the favorable risk group is 43 months, in the intermediate risk group it's 23 months, and in the poor risk group it's 8 months. We should point out that these overall survivals are definitely improved from the immunotherapy era. You know, before the favorable risk group uh, was about 37 months, the intermediate risk group was around 17 months, and the eight-month uh, eight group, the poor risk group, was about four months. So we've definitely made strides with targeted therapy. It's a testament to the efficacy of targeted therapy. 
We could be a little bit more specific now about the different patient populations because what I just showed you are prognostic factors that we could use in the first line, second line, in non-clear cell carcinomas. We've externally validated it. Um, uh, but now we can look at specific benchmarks as well. And although you might not use these benchmarks for everyday patient counseling, they're certainly important in clinical trial design and for statisticians to use in sample size calculations for upcoming clinical trials. So for example, you can identify progression-free survivals in the IMDC of first-line therapy, uh, specific uh, first-line therapy such as intermediate and poor risk groups with a diagnosis treatment interval less than one year, similar to the ADAPT inclusion criteria. So this was actually used in the sample size calculation. And you can see that the progression-free survivals and overall survivals in the different uh, um, uh, clinical trials such as TIVO1, Intersect, uh, Gold, they're actually fairly similar uh, to the clinical trials uh, that were already reported. Prognosis is not static though. It's actually a dynamic process. So for example, if we have a patient sitting in front of us and we say, uh, you know, the median overall survival that's predicted for you is 27 months or 44 months, um, what happens if a patient actually lives beyond that? So what happens if the patient comes back to you 36 months later or 56 months later and said, um, you were wrong, um, uh, what do we do then? So it shows us that prognosis, although we have in information from the baseline, it actually changes as we keep on going. So this is the concept of conditional survival. Conditional survival is how long, how does survival change for each individual patient as you survive, uh, as we gain more information about how long you survive. And specifically for those patients that actually survive past the median in their risk group, how does their conditional survival change? And so this is what's shown here. Lauren Harshman from our group uh, uh, published this. And this showed, uh, I'll take some time to explain it. In the y-axis here, this is the probability of living another two years. And on the x-axis, these are the months on targeted therapy that a patient already has been on. And of course, the favorable risk patients do better than the intermediate risk patients who do better than the poor risk patients at the outset, at baseline. But as time passes, you know, three months pass, six months pass on targeted therapy, nine, 12, 15, 18 months pass on targeted therapy, and you can see, actually, the poor risk patients, they actually exceed the intermediate risk patients. And so what this means is that what we identify at baseline, it can change. And of course, we know that intuitively, but now we can show this with data. This has been seen by other groups as well uh, in the SEER-based analysis. Uh, this was previously published. And you can see at baseline, this is someone's overall survival with stage four kidney cancer. If you've already lived 12 months, you can see the curve is a lot uh, better. If you've already um, uh, survived two years, three years, four years, five years, the more years you survive, obviously, uh, the better conditional survival you have uh, in the future. So I think we've really reached the ceiling of our prognostic factors. We've had a lot of different prognostic factor models, lots of clinical variables. Uh, there's a lot of publications on this, but I think we've reached a ceiling and we're in desperate need now to make it better by using biologic markers. And so uh, I hope that um, uh, there will be more data coming out looking at biomarkers, but not just on their own because they're not helpful on their own. We want to know how helpful they are if you add them to existing models such as the IMDC model. So if you add biomarker X and biomarker Y to the IMDC model, does it actually improve accuracy? If it doesn't improve accuracy, then it actually doesn't matter this biomarker uh, because we already have a clinical model that works. So there are some candidate examples. So this was published uh, by the Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network. And uh, there are different mRNA expression profiles, microRNA expression profiles, protein and DNA methylation uh, profiles that actually show favorable intermediate poor risk groups. <laughs> Of course, they haven't been combined with the clinical data because the clinical data wasn't available for this study, uh, but uh, I think uh, that would be an important next step. 
So I've told you all about prognostic factors for metastatic disease. Why are they important? Who cares? Do we actually use them in clinic? Uh, and I think uh, that was the second part of the title that I was given. And so, of course, prognostic factors, they're important for patient counseling. All patients want to know, well, is my prognosis measured in months? Is it measured in years? Um, and there's only so much the look test can tell us. You know, when we see someone uh, come in um, in our clinic, uh, there's only so much the look test can tell us. We need to be a little bit more specific, and so that's why prognostic factors are helpful for patient counseling. It's also important for clinical trial risk stratification and retrospective study adjustment methods. An ex example here is um, by the, uh, in the Italians, uh, Roberto Avai of Covelli and their group uh, looked at uh, sequencing of targeted therapy, looking at VEGF, VEGF, mTOR versus the VEGF, mTOR, VEGF strategy in a, in a subset of patients, in, all, in patients who've received three lines of targeted therapy. And they showed that the hazard ratio was 2.59 after adjusting for prognostic factors. Because you can imagine group A, group B in a retrospective study would be imbalanced, so you want to try to balance those prognostic factors by adjusting them using Cox proportional hazards regression modeling using our prognostic factors. So that's an example uh, here of, of using prognostic factors in a retrospective analysis. There are caveats to this data, of course. You can't adjust for things that you haven't collected. And uh, in, in this particular study, there was no excitinib, uh, and it assumes that you make three lines of therapy. Other reasons why prognostic factors are important, I think it's important for planning therapy, a patient's therapy. So for example, for temsorolimus, we can use temsorolimus in poor risk patients. Temsorolimus is not the only option for poor risk patients, uh, but you should use temsorolimus in poor risk patients. Uh, so that's an example of using prognostic factors for deciding on which treatment to use. Also, for prognostic factors, we can decide is active surveillance an appropriate strategy. So in very, very select patients, where there's a very small bulk of disease, you know, maybe four uh, lung metastases that cannot be resected, they're not actually growing on subsequent CT scans really quickly anyway, and they're favorable risk, maybe it's worthwhile to do some active surveillance for a little bit and spare the patient uh, the toxicities of targeted therapy. But of course, this is in a very highly selected group of patients. And finally, something that's more recent that we've used our prognostic factors for is asking the question, is cytoreductive nephrectomy appropriate? So I want to spend some time on cytoreductive nephrectomy. What is a cytoreductive nephrectomy? It's in the face of metastatic disease and you still have your primary intact. Should we take the primary kidney tumor out? We usually don't do that for lung cancer, for example. We don't take out the lung if you have bone and liver metastases. Uh, we don't do that in colorectal cancer, for example. But in kidney cancer, there are phase three trials that support the use of cytoreductive nephrectomy, albeit in the immunotherapy era. So we wanted to look at this in the targeted therapy era. So we looked at our database and at that time, there were 3,200 patients, and about 80% of patients had a nephrectomy. We wanted to exclude the patients that had a nephrectomy prior to developing metastatic disease, because that's not the question we're asking here. The question we're asking is, uh, for people with synchronous metastases, with their primary still intact, is a cytoreductive nephrectomy helpful? And so uh, if you exclude those patients, we're left with uh, 676 patients without cytoreductive nephrectomy and 982 patients with cytoreductive nephrectomy, and these are the two populations that we are comparing. And of course, this is the median overall survival, and there is a big difference, 20 months versus nine months, but of course you have to stop and uh, not really use this Kaplan-Meier curve because it's full of biases, right? You have to make sure that you adjust by all of our prognostic factors because maybe there's a reason why those cytoreductive nephrectomy patients actually got surgery. Maybe all the sick people didn't get uh, surgery, and so you can't pay too much attention to this curve. But this is the hazard ratio adjusted for our IMDC criteria. It's 0 0.6 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.52 and 0.69, suggesting that there is a favorable effect of cytoreductive nephrectomy um, in patients with synchronous metastatic disease. 
But do all patients benefit from a cytoreductive nephrectomy? Is there a way that we can cho choose who would benefit from a cytoreductive nephrectomy um, uh, uh, for now? And so this analysis was done at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, before the GUASCO deadline. Um, and uh, uh, this is what we looked at. And so uh, we looked at patients that had a median overall survival of less than three months or six months, nine, 12, 18, 24 months. And this is the difference in median overall survival for cytoreductive nephrectomy versus not. And what I want to point out is actually the incremental benefit, the difference between not getting a nephrectomy versus getting a nephrectomy. You can see if you don't live very long, there actually is no difference, not much difference. Even if your median survival is estimated to be 12 months, you know, your incremental benefit of two months, that's pretty questionable whether or not you should subject someone to a full surgery and have to recover if they're benefit it is only about two months. And the benefit really improves, it increases as we have a longer projected median overall survival. I think we all already knew this. We all intuitively know not to do a cytoreductive nephrectomy in someone with very, very poor risk or very, very pro poor prognosis. But now I think we have data uh, to support that. And here are the adjusted hazard ratios. You can see the hazard ratios uh, touch unity uh, over here. But as we reach 18, 12, uh, 18, 24 months, 36 months, it more approaches the hazard ratio of 0.6 that we see. Using the IMDC prognostic factors, we also did this analysis um, looking at, well, can we predict how you'll benefit from a cytoreductive nephrectomy based on the number of criteria you have. And so if you have no criteria, actually, we couldn't do that analysis because most patients with no criteria with favorable risk disease got a cytoreductive nephrectomy, uh, which reflects current day practice. Similarly, if you had all six factors, we couldn't do that analysis either because most patients didn't get a cytoreductive nephrectomy, and there are very few patients with all six factors. So what about all those in between? Well, if you have one, two, or three of those factors, there was quite a difference in terms of median overall survival. But if you have four, five, or six factors, four or five factors, there actually wasn't much of a difference, so it might not be useful. So cytoreductive nephrectomy perhaps is not appropriate for patients with a survival estimated to be less than one year, and perhaps it's not appropriate in patients with uh, more than uh, four or more adverse prognostic factors. So. In conclusion, prognosis is important for patients counseling, study design, and planning therapy. Prognosis is a dynamic process. It's not just at baseline. And finally, prognosis needs to be improved with biomarkers. And hopefully, you use these prognostic scores in your clinic. Thank you very much.